Hello and welcome to this episode of Survival Skills Africa where I'm going to go through a couple of methods that you can use to ensure that you manage to make a survival fire in the wilderness. I'm going to use some of the things in my bag and I'm going to use some of the things in my environment. I'm going to make a bow drill fire, I'm going to use flint and steel and I'm going to show you how to use a ferro rod. It doesn't matter what resources you're carrying with you or are not carrying with you, you'll manage to make a fire, stay warm and boil your water. I'm Clarice, welcome to the Live Ready channel. What I've got with me is my bow drill kit, my current kit. Um, I lost my previous bow, so I've just grabbed this one from the branches in the area. Um, and I've got a little spindle and an old hearth board that I've used a couple of times. Now I'm running into a knot over here, so I'm going to start either on this side or on the opposite side, possibly over here. That might be it. Okay, so I'll make another notch. Um, so just to score a notch, quick and easy. Now <clears throat> this is by no means a comprehensive video on how to make bow drill fires. I'm going to move this up a little bit over there. That actually warrants a video all by itself. This is pine and um, it is dry. I harvested it from a standing um, dead pine. The principles behind a bow drill fire is that you're using a spindle to drill into your hearth board what it does is it creates sawdust and a lot of heat and from that spinning in the hearth board that sawdust accumulates on what we call a dust pan or a catch pan over there and because you're generating heat the sawdust consolidates into an ember and it's that ember that you then transfer into a tinder bundle or a little tinder nest that you've prepared beforehand this over here is um, just my bearing block it's a piece of wood that I fire hardened because I don't want my drill to drill through my bearing block I wanted to drill um, into and through my hearth board so this needs to be really hard this should preferably be a soft wood and this should really be a soft wood my bow is about arm's length Now that my initial burning is done, or at least some of it, I can start to cut my notch. And I ideally just want an eighth of that to come out. And I'm going to score it so that my wood doesn't break away. And then I'm going to very patiently cut out that notch. The purpose of the notch is just to allow oxygen to get to the sawdust so that it can consolidate and form a coal or an ember. So I have to seat my spindle nicely in here, get my set to work together really nicely to basically run smoothly um, and then finish my burn in until I'm about halfway through which I'm nearly and then I can go for an ember. Put my catch pan in there, that's going to catch my ember Hopefully, get my spindle all set up. As far as bow drill fires go, it's not the first thing that you start looking for in a survival situation. It takes a lot of energy to make a bow drill kit, to find the materials that you need for a bow drill kit, and then to drill for fire. So if you haven't been eating properly, the last thing you want is to spend a lot of time and energy trying to get a bow drill fire going. Now that my initial burning is done and I've accumulated a nice bit of sawdust here, I can go for an ember. Ideally what you would do is, if you're really cold and vulnerable, you would use your lighter. Once you have recovered your core body temperature and you've settled in, you've had something to eat, the following fires can be made using a ferro rod, unless you have enough energy and enough time to start a ferro rod fire 
and it's not an absolute emergency, then you leave the gas for later. And when you've been um, eating properly, you've had a bit of time to search for materials, then do you start looking for the things that you need for a Bodil fire kit. got an ember. I'm just letting it sit there for a moment. Notice how I've stopped drilling but there's still smoke. Okay I'm going to remove my spindle very carefully. It's smoking so I've got an ember. I'm just going to lift my foot very carefully. Now, I don't want to move it too fast, but I sort of want to get my little bird's nest ready. I can now just release this here. Take my little bird's nest that I've prepared with some soft burny stuff. Move my ember, transfer it to my bird's nest. Close it in there. I don't have a whole lot of tinder here. Now, of course, one does need to actually practice the skill of making fire with a ferro rod, making fire with a bow drill, and practice using different kinds of woods um, for making bow drill fires because you will need to adjust your technique a little bit. If you've got a harder wood, um, you might need to drill first to accumulate quite a bit of sawdust and then only try to ignite that sawdust thereafter. Whereas if you've got a very soft wood, you might be able to drill, get sawdust and light it into an ember um, all in one go. And just like that, I've got a bow drill fire. Okay, I've prepared some kindling. Nice Make sure that you've got all your fire making materials ready before you even start on the bow drill. I think I need to move my fire. That way. So that by the time you get fire, you're ready with everything you need. In all the excitement, I put my bow on the fire as well. Luckily I saved the paracord because that's difficult to get a hold of in the bush. The other thing that makes pine a brilliant survival resource is fatwood. So fatwood is basically the resinous heartwood of a pine tree and if this branch was still whole and I cut into it I'd probably find there's quite a bit of fatwood inside here. At the moment it's hard to tell there's not much in there but usually you could find quite a bit of fatwood um, in the branches of the tree and the way you can tell whether it's fatwood or not is it would have this resinous smell to it basically like this piece of resin has over here and that resinous smell um, also gives it that caramel kind of color it's that congealed um, resin that sits inside that wood so you're able to tell that, that you've got fat wood quite easily um, and it takes a spark really quickly from say a ferro rod and it also burns quite well and quite long. And we'll go and light a fire with that. If you can, don't pass by any resources in your environment. Try and collect them as you go. So I'm just going to take all of this grass and make it into a really fine tinder bundle. You should have your wood as well. So all of mine is lying over here. I've stacked a whole bunch of wood um, for, for my fire so that I have enough wood. I want to collect enough wood during daylight hours before it starts getting dark. So making a bow drill fire, even though you've got a mechanical advantage, is great. But you must remember that you still have to go and search for the materials. And on top of that, you've got to first make the bow drill kit. So if you haven't eaten a lot, 
um, because you haven't been so successful in foraging. There's my fire kit. Remember that from before I crossed the river. And in here, I've got a couple of options. One of my favorites is a ferro rod because it does not fail. A ferro rod will always give you fire. And use the spine of your knife, not the belly of your lathe, to try and scrape along a ferro rod. You don't want to dull your knife. Often the things that you find growing by the riverbed is also really flammable. And see if you can start fire with that. You can get many more fires from a ferro rod than you can with a lighter. And I've cleared the area around here just so that I have enough space to make a fire without setting the bush on fire. This is also a good time to start thinking about future fires. So we want to try to conserve our resources as far as possible. So we don't want to continue using our lighter um, because that's a resource that's easily depleted. We don't want to continuously use our ferro rod. So that's why something like a bow drill fire is really nice because the only resource that you are really using um, is basically the energy in your own body. vital to recognize the resources that you have at your disposal in the wilderness. From being in the fire some of these rocks have split and are left with some very sharp edges. You can easily use some of these as cutting tools once they've cooled down. Like this one here. That's pretty sharp and I can nap it a little to refine the edge and make an arrowhead or some spear tips from that. Um, so this is my bearing block. I'm keeping it ready because I want to fire harden it a little bit more. And um, the other thing that I can look at doing now is to make a little bit of char cloth. So that's something that does use one of our resources. We need a little bit of fabric for that. So this one over here is a 100% cotton cloth. And I've got a fire kit that I've emptied out. And I'm basically just going to a few pieces of this cloth, put them inside my tin and that char cloth is going to help me to start fire with flint and steel. Um, now there is a little bit of a confusion between what a ferro rod is and what flint and steel is. Flint is actually a stone, it's a naturally occurring rock that you find in the bush, usually in riverbeds. And that's basically just taking a steel striker or something that's high carbon steel going around and taking that high carbon steel and bashing it against a stone to see what you can get sparks off of. So I'm cutting, not very well, but cutting little pieces of fabric. And this is just going to help me to ensure that I have multiple ways of starting fires in the future. So that if for whatever reason I can't manage to get a bow drill fire going, um, I have the option of using flint and steel or I can use a ferro rod and that's why we also keep dry tinder in our bags. Okay, so I'm just going to do a couple. Okay. And once I've got enough pieces of fabric in my tin, maybe just do one more, um, I can put them on the fire. You don't have to actually make a hole in the tin. You literally can just put the tin on the fire. Very few tins actually seal 100% um, airproof. So I'm just putting that in there. My tin now goes on my fire. I'm going to put it in such a way that I can see if there's a flame coming out of this side, then I know that the, the char cloth that I'm busy making is being processed. So that flame is usually given off um, because the synthetic materials and the chemicals that are used to produce that cloth are burning off. So this is an anaerobic environment that I'm creating to process that char cloth. But once the flame goes out, I know that my char cloth is done being processed and I can take my tin off of the fire. Since it's done being processed, I can now take my tin off the fire. I'm just going to let it cool on the side. I don't want to open it just yet because, oh that's hot. If I open it too soon, um, there's so much heat in there that my char cloth is just going to combust. You know, sitting out here in the wilderness, I just think of one of my favorite scriptures is Deuteronomy 32 verse 10. And it says he found him in a desert land in the waste howling wilderness. And he led him about, he instructed him and he kept him as the apple of his eye. And I personally think it's why so many of the prophets and Jesus himself were led into the wilderness is because God's presence here is so magnified. Once you remove the smog and the distractions of city or of um, the built up world, 
then we start to actually connect with God. And I think it's also a cleansing process for us. We warm my tea a bit. So don't feel like because you're alone in the wilderness, you are absolutely forsaken. Um, God's presence can be wherever you go. You just actually have to ask him to join you there. So I reckon my tin has cooled down sufficiently for me to actually open it up and to see whether we've got some usable char cloth in here. Oh, a smoky fire. Okay. That actually looks pretty good. Char cloth is basically what you would call coal or charcoal, um, but it's made from a very finely woven fabric. Usually we use natural fibers to do it, linen or cotton, and um, that basically is going to take a spark really easily from something like flint and steel. But to use flint and steel, I need a tinder bundle. So I'll process that in a second. And this is basically flint stone. So you can see that it's a really clear stone. Um, it's got a really cool color to it. And then a steel striker is basically just something that's made out of really high carbon steel. You can use your knife or you can use something like the spine of a silky saw. So this stuff burns really easily. So I'm just going to give that a little rub. That's going to be the center of my tinder bundle. And this is just some relatively dry grass. Considering that it rained earlier, we're not going to have a whole lot of dry stuff in the area. That's why my fire pops and crackles so much. I'm basically just rubbing the inside to make it really, really fine. And then I'm going to add this really fine stuff that grows along the river as well. Okay. Now, if you really want to not make a fire out of this, you would make a much bigger tinder bundle, but because I've already got a fire going and this is just for demonstration, just the small tinder bundle is going to do it. So it's like a little bird's nest. Now you can, if you find some punk wood, which is basically a really soft, um, almost decaying wood, you can use punk wood um, to start a fire with flint and steel as well. In this case, I'm just going to show you the char cloth. To light the char cloth, all I've really got to do is send some sparks into it. Just got to hold it up there. Oh. Okay, so you can't see it, not very clearly. There's a little bit of it that's showing now but it has actually been lit and now I can just take this char cloth transfer it to my tinder bundle and almost immediately it starts smoking and when your tinder bundle is really nicely processed the job is pretty much done and you've just got to wait and see that it actually catches a light. That's it. Fire. If your fire gets to the point where it starts to make a whole lot of ash, um, let's say it's pretty much gone out, you can now start to think about fire hardening things. So this is a bearing block that I use for my bow drill. I fire hardened it before, but because I'm constantly drilling in that notch, I can re-fire harden that notch or re-harden that notch in the fire. So what I want to do is I just want to place it in among the ashes. I don't want it to catch a light, so I've got to be really careful to make it warm, but not so warm that it will catch a light. So I'm just going to leave it there in the hot ash. I can put some stuff on top of it just to make sure it gets all of the heat. Okay, smoking, so it's pretty warm now. This guy is looking pretty good for fire hardening, and um, I'm pretty sure this bearing block is going to last quite a bit longer still. There we go.
Well, thanks for hanging out in the wilderness with me today. I hope that this helps you to polish off your survival fire making skills. Remember to watch the consolidated video on survival skills in Africa that basically puts all of these survival skills episodes together in one. Don't leave without dropping a comment below. Let me know if you've got any more survival tips. I'd love to hear from you guys. And until the next time, live ready.